This evening is particularly special for all of us because it's an opportunity for us to talk with um, someone who is who is part of the Extended Film Society family. He's a fixture at this festival and has been for a long time. Um, and this year he's uh, participating in the festival in a new way than he has before, than he has in the past. And that's as uh, a collaborator with another artist on this poster that is sitting right in between us. Please welcome Ed Lockman. I'm just going to tee up. I'm just going to tee up something, which is, uh, Ed, you were here last year, uh, as you have been a number of times at the festival in your role as a cinematographer for a film in the festival, um, and that was uh, Wonderstruck, which was shot here in New York and um, you're premiering it here at the festival, or debuting it for New, for New York here at the festival. And then something happened, which led to what we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna, I wanna tee that up for you and then tell you that um, we're gonna talk for 35 or 40 minutes, take some questions from you, and then you'll have an opportunity to, to talk with Ed more personally, and if you'd like, purchase a poster, he'll sign it for you, and that'll happen a little later in the evening. So um, you were here last year, and then something happened. How did this happen? Well, it actually started at uh, Telluride uh, in Colorado, a small film festival. And uh, I was at, at, a, at a dinner. Um, actually, this happened at a dinner also in New York. Um, but at that dinner, th there were the filmmakers uh, that had films at Telluride last year. And I sat next to this, this guy where, there. That's JR. I sat next to him and I, and I didn't know who he was. I, I, I said, you know, we're both wearing hats. You know, who are you? And he goes, <laughs> I'm JR. I go, oh my God, JR, I've been following your work for years. I love your work. And we like hit it off right away. And by the end of the evening, we said to each other, we should do something together. He's a very, engaging, embracing kind of spirit. You know, if you're around them, you just want to do something with them. And uh, so that was that. And then he was at the festival with Faces and Places that he had done with Agnes Gadar, which I hadn't seen yet. Agnes Varda, Agnes Gadar, yeah. She's a cinematographer. <laughs> I only think about cinema, Agnes Varda. And then, I was here last year at the New York Film Festival, which I've been at for probably over 45 years, I've kind of tracked. And I was at a dinner sitting next to Daniel Stern, who's the president of the Film Society. And we started talking, we talk about everything, but we started talking about posters. And I don't know what I said, but he looked at me and said, why don't you do the poster next year? And I was kind of a little in shock. I would go, well, you always give it, in my mind, you always give it to very well-known artists and, uh, and well, they, uh, Julian Schnabel, which he's a well-known artist, but a filmmaker. And um, I said, well, let me think about it and see if I have an idea. So I, I had a lot of ideas. Uh, what, one idea I had was, um, Hiroshi Tsukamoto, who does those uh, images in a, in a movie theater, like their old movie palaces, and you see the light from the screen illuminates the whole empty theater. And what I loved about his images is when I read about what his ideas were, he said he wanted to encapsulate the spirit of, and the emotions and light of cinema in one image and that he would do a, t he shot with an eight by 10 camera and he would shoot for, he figured out that there were about 170,000 images in a two hour film. And he would use the images in the film to light the theater. So conceptually it was like a wild idea what he was doing. So I immediately thought of the idea of, I wanna shoot in Alice Tully Hall and shoot a similar image. But then I felt, well, that's kind of like I'm appropriating another pho photographer artist's work. And, and, I w and then I thought about Magritte, and I wanted to do kind of a collage idea of that, how Magritte, René Magritte, 
did images and would did uh, like strips because for me it felt like a film. And actually I liked the poster last year with it, with this cityscape looking like strips of film that uh, was Sarah, Sarah did last year. Yeah. Um, and then it, it hit me, oh my God, I could do this project with JR. So I called JR and I said, why don't we do the poster for the New York Film Festival? He says, that's a great idea. So we still didn't have any ideas about what to do, but I realized, I said, your eyes are so emblematic. And how many people know JR's work? Because most of you are, all right. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about JR, but he's this incredible artist. He's only about 35 years old. He's, his work has come to fruition from 2007 till today, so about 12 years. And he's got a TED award, he's, he's gotten every major artistic award. And he started out as a graffiti artist in, in Paris. And he, he did something, he documented his friends. He was living in this um, poor neighborhood, um, Cité, uh, Bouquet, I, did I pronounce that right? Yes, City Bouquet. And he documented his friends who were, uh, they, when they would tag buildings in their graffiti, and he documented the riots in 2005 in this area. And he then had the idea of making them posters, like doing it on like just glue and, and uh, simple photographic paper and putting them on buildings and doing it obviously illegal. He didn't have permission to do this and most of his work is under the radar. And uh, it got a great effect because it, what it does is his work kind of in, in, gives recognition to, the, to people that are nameless and faceless and it starts a dialogue in the community. And uh, so anyway, I, I started to think, well, what are the things about the New York Film Festival that were close to me? So certainly they're the filmmakers, and I really, that's been my film school, has been the New York Film Festival and, and MoMA. I mean, I met a number of directors here and ended up working with many of them. But, so what is more receiving or, uh, is their eyes. Their eyes are their mind, their, their heart, their spirit. So I thought, wow, we could use your idea of how you use eyes. Now, other artists have used eyes. You know, if you look at Man Ray and uh, Duchamp and uh, um, uh, Bunuel in uh, En Chandelou, Andalou, and uh, so, so, you know, and, and, and then Man Ray used the eye with the, the, the tears around the eye. And, and, but anyway, he's, he's used eyes in, in, in ways of empowering people, you know, and, and using them in, the, in his context. So I thought, all right, we'll, we'll use the eyes, you know, but of the directors of the festival. So, so that was one idea, and then, the evolution of, well, I want the people that are part of the festival, the people that are behind the scenes, people that work at the festival, the, the people that work, you know, behind, you know, the projectionists, the people in the offices, the people that, and then also the people that are the audience, the people that are in the street, because that's very much part of what his work is. So, and then we came up with the idea of doing it in an alleyway, because an alleyway, is more New York than anything. You know, we all recognize New York from our alleyways. So we then reached out to, where am I gonna get the rights to use these people's eyes? So David Gottlis, and who's a photographer at the festival, was very generous, said you can use whatever you want. And we went through the the eyes of directors that I were, were important to me in the festival. And we actually printed it on, he has like a, a machine that's like for uh, architectural design paper that you just print out, you know, so it's very cheap 
uh, paper and just with glue. So we made these, these um, like poster images, put cardboard behind it, and, but we made them in different sizes because he knew also that if, if they're in the back, they have to be bigger than the ones in the front. So we made them in different sizes and we made about 90 of them. Uh, but of course, once we got all the people together and we put them in the uh, alleyway, which we didn't have rights to, so we were like stealing that, uh, they all ran in and they just held them up. And we did it a couple times with different eyes and then we assembled them in this image. Um, and then I realized, oh my God, there's certain people that are important that aren't in this, these images. So I then kind of stole them off of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and then the PR department got upset with me and said, if we don't have rights to these eyes, you can't use them. I said, well, I can't go back and reshoot this, you know. So then there was this long process of getting the rights to the eyes. And, I, <laughs> and now, you know, we're gonna have a competition about whose eyes, what director. Even in the film festival, in the PR office, in the directors, nobody knows whose these eyes are. But <laughs> one, one person does. Well, yeah, one person picked out, well, so far they, in the competition, people have been, oh, I know you know. who they are, yeah. There are eight eyes that people have delineated. So, but I'm, I'm like astounded that people don't know whose eyes are whose. But whatever. <laughs> I, I've been living with it, so. We can, so play, that game. We can play that game later. I mean, there's yeah. a few that immediately come to mind right. for me that I can sort of pick out, but it stops at like maybe eight or 10 without any prompting. Um, right. And, and, and by the way, as someone who was holding up one of these pairs of eyes <laughs> on that morning, we didn't, as one of the people who works at the Film Society, Ed and JR kept their plan relatively to themselves because we, we were just told, we were sent an email that said, okay, be at, it was, this was in Freeman's Alley downtown, if you know where that is, um, be at Freeman's Alley at 9 a.m. on this day, it was in June, um, and just be there and, and wear, I think you said, wear brightly colored clothing or, you know, but solid, brightly colored clothing. But beyond that, we had no idea what we were showing up to do. Um, and we get there and, and Ed and JR have, have a set prepared and there's all these eyes printed on all these different size paper. And then, and then you guys just started placing people and there's people like up in the other buildings and other coming off of fire escapes. and. Illegally, we didn't have rights to that building, and <laughs> so and there's Jr. We got Jr. in, but that was good. I I actually had my image in, but I took it out because you know we we needed more women. Actually, I showed it to somebody. You don't have enough women, so I made sure we had more women in it. So anyway, so my thank you to Daniel because he it was his idea to allow someone like me to do this. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And it was a real challenge. And, and for me, it was like making a film. Like the reason I even reached out to someone else to work with me on it is because in the filmmaking process, I'm always collaborating with other people to create images. So for me, there was no great step or ego to want to work with another artist to create this image. And JR was so, how can I say, embracing and, and it's all about what his work is anyway. I, I wanted to tell you more about his work than why I did it and uh, some of the things that he did. He, did, he usually goes into um, underdeveloped areas and uh, dangerous areas. He went into a favela in in, uh, uh, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, which was very dangerous. There was just like a murder of three uh, people in a gang war. And he went in and he explained to people what he wanted to do. He wanted to um, give honor to the women in that community who are really the support for that community and have also suffered losing their brother, their son, their father, 
and they got it. And, and he then photographed the women and then put them all over the buildings of the community. And then from even the money he got there, he built a cultural center for artists to go there and work and work in the community. And his work is very much like that. He, recently he did a project on the border of Mexico and the United States where he went over it on the Mexican side and he w uh, was introduced to these uh, family and there was a one-year-old child. And the child, if you've seen this image, it's remarkable. He built a 60-foot um, scaffolding apparatus and took a picture of this child and the child's like peering over the wall into the United States. But what he did that was even greater than that is he then set up a table. One side of the table was an eye on the Mexican side. The other side of the table was an eye on the American side and they had a meal together. And people passed food back and forth from the table. And he even had one of the border guards take his picture from the American side to the Mexican side. So he's always finding ways of engaging the community to go beyond the political context, to see each other as humans. He did this other uh, a piece in uh, Palestine and Israel called Face to Face, where he took uh, a priest, a rabbi and an imam, and had them like uh, mug shots, like make crazy f faces. And then he placed those images on the Israeli side and then also on the Palestinian side. And what he said was the heroes of that were the people that allowed those images to be on their houses. So he's always finding a way of trying to connect the community in a way that what's not seen is seen, so it can start some kind of dialogue amongst each other. So I guess that, unless For that they, piece in the Middle East, I, I saw him. Uh, I saw him at a talk recently, and he said that what was also interesting is after taking those three photos and pasting them all on both sides of, of this divide, when you look up close at people making these faces and, and up, you know. Up close, you, you couldn't tell who was whom and who was from where. It, 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 it sort of dissolved that, that border um, when you were just looking at someone's face close up. He, he's not done another uh, piece that's ongoing called Inside Out. Uh, he got $100,000 from the TED organization, and he put it in this project where People can send in, there's been 108 countries and 150,000 people he's done this for, where they send an image of anything of themselves, of their dog, whatever. And then in his studio in Paris, they make like a poster image, a large poster size image of whatever somebody sends to them and they send it back to them and they can distribute it or explain, uh, display it anywhere they want. So again, he, he lets them be a co-collaborator in his work. So maybe with finishing this, unless you have questions, I, because he couldn't be here because he, he's in Berlin and he thought he would be here and unfortunately he can't because it's about another commission and that, that the, he had to stay longer. Um, I did uh, like a, a little video note to him to thank him. And I wanna reach out and thank Laura Israel who uh, is a filmmaker herself who did um, the film about Robert Frank, Do, uh, Don't, Don't Blink. And she's been his uh, editor for years and. A, close friend of mine and and I asked her and which we did this in two hours that I had did it well I'll just show you but it was uh, this was kind of a a thank you to JR and I and then I thought well maybe we could show it here so let's watch the clip uh, and then we'll take some questions from the audience for you uh, if you have a question raise your hand wait for the mic so that uh, folks that are watching this on YouTube can hear you. 
Um, so who has a question uh, for Ed about his work on this with JR or anything that, uh, that Ed has worked on? We're open to your questions. Self-explanatory. <laughs> <laughs> it always takes about 15 to 20 seconds for someone to raise their hands. Who wants to be first? Yeah, just wait for the mic and we'll go right there. I know you mentioned uh, you spend a lot of time trying to get rights uh, for some of these images, but also that, uh, that alleyway wasn't necessarily sanctioned for your photo and all of that stuff. Um, what kind of commentary are you trying to make in terms of sometimes in order to connect with your community, you kind of have to do things illegally or all of that stuff? Or do you have any now opinions about digital rights and uh, things like that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, certainly his work uh, has certain guerrilla aspect to it, and that's what graffiti art is about. Um, yeah, I, I think you're very single-minded about what you do when you do your work, and then you find out a way to make it happen after. You know, there were certain filmmakers that they didn't photograph, like Antonioni or... Fellini or, you know, they, they just, they didn't have those images in their archives, so, and they're important to the festival, so I just figured we'd figure it out later, you know, and, but it was down to the line. I mean, we didn't have Chantel Ackerman till like the day that the poster was going to be printed, and I reached out to Ken Jones, and oh, I'll call her sister, you know, and we got the rights, or, Sometimes, you know, like uh, Shutterstock is a contributor to the festival, so that was all right. And then I paid something to the Getty uh, archive to get images. But then there were some you couldn't find. It said, you know, it's not listed. So we had to go further, like the one on Fossbinder. We had to go to the foundation of Fossbinder to get that image you know, to protect them, that they don't later get sued, you know, that, uh, but maybe they won't know who the images are anyway, so. <laughs> the, uh, the, this photo, this poster was definitely a collaboration of a number of artists, um, and, and thankfully, uh, so many of them, uh, as we reached out over the past few months after the image was finished, the, the next phase was really the last few weeks or more than a couple months of, of just making all the calls and writing all the emails and getting all these images cleared. And it was down to the wire that that last image and the poster just went to print within the past two weeks, I think, um, to have it ready in time for the festival. Mm -hmm. So it ended up being a, a collaboration that spanned uh, so many artists who were, who were wonderful, about, wonderfully generous about uh, allowing their images yeah. to be used. Th thanks for putting up with me. It was fun. <laughs> it, was fun. It, was a fun it was a fun summer putting yeah. this together, for sure. Um, yes, hi. Oh, let's wait for the microphone, and we'll, we'll take it. Hi, I have a question. I'm a cinematographer myself, and I wanted to know, you know, you say that in this project you figure it out later. How is your approach also in every film that you do in terms of, like, cinematography? Do you figure it out later, or actually, like, you know, you try to... to Wait, you mean the preparation, yes. how I figure it? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's all about the preparation, you know? Mm -hmm. it, like, yeah. every story, every period, every uh, director, you, you have to... I, it's about the, the visual research, but also about why those images exist. They want. I always feel images are about point of view in your storytelling. So who are you telling the story through, you know? And then that, that's a clue to like how you approach the images. But I work with someone like Todd Haynes. He, he does so much research visually about his ideas that it's very easy for me to plug into what his uh, images are about. And then, you know, I certainly add something to that, but it's his, initiation and I always say this you know not all directors are visual now for me cinematography is the language of cinema not words but that's because that's the way I see things or understand things but um, when you work with a director that isn't visual then you have to find a common ground to show them that an image can be a metaphor for the storytelling that it's not going to take away 
um, their idea, you know, because, you know, I mean, many films, the images are, I call it, icing on the cake, you know, they're the, they're, the, but the question is, what's the substance, you know, and so that's what you're always looking for, you know, what, what creates the uh, emotion in the characters that you're viewing, but also the way you see them, you know. Thank you. We'll come, uh, let's go down here. Uh, sort of coming off that question, how do you approach working with a director, and especially a director, that it maybe it's your first collaboration? Is there like a line that you, I feel, how do you walk the line of making sure that you're contributing and and being heard, but not stepping the bound and stepping on his toe, his or her toes as far as saying too much? Like, do, do you ever feel? Yeah, that, that's a good question. When I, when I read a script, I, I have a lot of visual ideas, and I usually go to the interview with books, and I show them my ideas. And I think that really, either the directors or some directors I found are threatened by that. They think like maybe they don't have the ideas yet themselves. So they want to know, you know, I'm sure I didn't do certain films because of that, because they thought, I don't know what they thought. I, I mean, I remember one interview I had not mentioning the director and I said, do you see the uh, film as naturalistic or expressionistic? And he looked at me and goes, well, what do you mean? And I knew I wasn't going to do that job, you know. <laughs> so, so I just think you, you just have to be very upfront. And even if they're not his ideas, at least he thinks I, I have ideas, you know. So I would say if you're a cinematographer, go in with ideas and say this might not be the only choice, but here's a possibility of the way I thought about it to approach the story. You know, and so you have to find your, your common language together. And the hardest part is to be consistent because I, I've been there where the director sees something cool the last weekend about another film and they say, why don't we do it that way, you know, and... He has a follow-up. Sorry, and then, like, just off of that, what about, like, when you're on set, cameras rolling, you cut between takes and like, are you seeing something that he or she is not catching or, or you have an idea or there's something in the background? Like, you know, do you, that, what kind of input, do you keep your input on the set to just camera and, and that kind of thing or, or how sure. into? Sure, I mean, you, look, the thing you, you go about a style in a film is you go in with obviously preconceived ideas, but then you have to relate to what's actually happening because Film lives in the moment. And, and I find directors that want to be rigid and hold on to an idea, they sometimes miss what's in front of them. Mm. And so I, you have to be open to those moments. And anyway, th I think that's you know, an important part of what you do. You have to see what's in front of you. At, at, at what at what age, do you recall at what age you realized or acknowledged to yourself your own propensity, passion, ability in this area, in this, in, in, in both capturing, noticing, and sharing images? Not, not really. I mean, I, I, I can say this, you know, I was in art school studying painting and, uh, and I took this gut course at Harvard in uh, film appreciation, and then it all kind of made sense. And then, like we all do when you're young, you imitate people that you respect. And only later did I realize the people that I wanted to imitate is the reason why I felt the way I did about images. And it was people like Robert Frank. Um, I started with the Maisel brothers. So my background was really documentary and I never tried to leave that. And so I, I love the found moment. I, I love images that you kind of discover in the moment, but I go in with preparation to find those moments. Mm. And 
Todd has become more and more that way. Todd, Todd has a great intellectual visual capacity to stylize ideas, but now he, more and more he's more open to the moment. You know, that would seem to Todd Haynes that would seem to have grown out of your. Uh, I don't know, but it seems like I, I think he trusts. You know, it's about. I'll say it this way: it's about trusting images. You know, like you go into a situation, and you know, what am I going to get out of this? Is it going to work or not? But somehow you have to trust the moment you're in to create those images. Are there a common set of mistakes or or? Uh, I'll use the word mistakes, that, that younger cinematographers, less established or experienced cinematographers well, make in well, trying I know, to Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm seeing films the last year of very young cinematographers that I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm. You know, I can tell you, you know, uh, th this guy, uh, I just saw this film, uh, uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me? Um, this um, Melissa McCarthy is Melissa it? Melissa McCarthy is yeah. the star. She's the lead. Beautifully, she, I, I found out the guy's name. I called him up, Brad Trost, you know. Then I just saw uh, the, the, the film, what? Sorry to bother you. Yeah, S sorry to, uh, you know, sorry to bother you. Well, beautifully shot, you know. Young, they did it for two and a half million dollars. I, I'm 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 inspired by all these. There's a film at this festival, uh, Happy Lazara, beautifully shot, young cinematographer. So, thank you. Let's take some more uh, questions. There's. Let's go back, all the way to the back, and then we'll come back up here to the second row. Hearing you speak about JR, I think it's maybe safe to assume you've seen faces, places. Wait. wait whether you've seen Faces Places. It's safe to assume you've seen Faces oh, Places. Oh, of course, yeah, I, I, I saw thought so. it. Yeah, of course. I was fortunate to see it here a few months ago, and seeing this photograph um, and thinking back to that film with JR, it seemed as though the element of the eyes was such a strong topic. I'm wondering if that was at ever at all a jumping off point in your, dis your initial discussions for this piece. Yeah, maybe you could elaborate on the conversation you had about the eyes, and it, it's, uh, there's clearly a connection to yeah, his work. Yeah, no, I, I said to him, I, I said, J.R., you know, your eyes are so emblematic of, of your work, but I realize he, what, what I'm trying to do with the poster is encapsulate what the New York Film Festival is. And l like the statement I, I read from... Uh, Sugimoto about these empty movie palaces that he photographed that he, I, I really got the idea somewhat from him say how could I capture the emotion, the light, the spirit of cinema in one image. And so for me it was also how do you capture the New York Film Festival in one image. And so, well one I want to show something of New York and two, I want to show the directors of the thing that make the festival the festival. And then it's the, the people. You, you receive the images. You complete the images. And so it just kind of came together. You know, it wasn't, it, we just kind of did it. You know, it's like any work, you have a kind of a preconceived idea, and then you just kind of let it happen with you, you know, and you don't know how it's going to end up, but you go with your instincts along the way. Great. Thank you. Hmm. We can do a couple more uh, questions. Why don't we go up here, and then we'll go towards the back. We'll go here to the second row, and I see a couple more hands. We'll do. Yes. I have a question. Uh, with all the many different tasks and 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 creative, you know, um, inputs that you have to have as a director of photography, is there one that in particular you enjoy the most? Is it the work with camera, or lighting, or the processing as you still shoot in film? And if within that, do you still operate? Do you like to operate the camera? And do you, are you open f to let the director operate if it's a shot the director wants to mm -hmm. shoot it? All right, a lot of questions. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I only used to operate. Now, it depends on the size of the film. If the film is too big, I have too much to do, I can't operate. And also, some ways I can do more intricate things with an operator time-wise. But it, it depends on the film. Um, and what were the other questions? Oh, aspect that you like. You know, when I when I would DP and uh, operate, uh, the lighting was the most important thing, and then the operating, I just got on the camera and did it. You know, uh, you know, people say, do you have certain things that are, you know, yours? You know, I, I, I you know, or consistent? Do you do things the same way in every film? I'm, I'm sure I have a sensibility about framing that's similar, even though I try to change that. Um, lighting, I can, I can change lighting, you know, not fall back that I have to light things the same way. But uh, your use of the cameras, like your handwriting, is, is f as much as you try to get away from what you did before, somehow there's part of it it might grow, but you always have part of that with you. And I know when I look at other people's films, the films I probably like the most visually are things that I feel closest to myself. Your question also touched on film versus digital. No, 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 I know the yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, 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 well, uh, yeah, I've, I've certainly had, you know, like Steven Soderbergh, it, the last film he worked with a cinematographer, he operated half of that film. Um, oh yeah, I, 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 I think he became a great cameraman. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and, and like directors say this, but it's kind of true that the operator is the first audience for the actor, and to see a performance uh, through the camera is uh, a, a wonderful kind of relationship between the actor and the, the uh, cinematographer. In fact, many times they'll look to you to get a reaction if the take was good or not, you know, or they'll talk to you. So I, under, I understand why certain directors want to operate, but I've also directed and operated, and it, the operating does take you away from things that you should be experiencing outside of the camera. Mm. So when I've done that, I do it very simply, so I can concentrate on the performance and not just the camera movement. <coughs> Uh, there was one in the back, and then we'll come up front. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, public, for doing this. It's fantastic. Um, as an artist, moving to a new medium that you really never thought about, and you were nervous about it, I can attest to that <laughs> when, when I asked you. Uh, what, did you has, what did you learn from the process and from JR that maybe affected the, what next, the t next movie you're going to shoot? And I think for the audience, it'd be fun to know what you're working on it now. What, what do you think about now? In the, back in the film business and, and your cinematography world, what are you working on now? Those two questions. Yeah. Well, what I was saying to you about cinematography is to trust the moment. You know, like I didn't know how all these people would end up in their position. Originally, before JR got there, I started placing these images like on the fire escape, very uh, horizontal. And when he got there, he goes, ah, let's just let it be what it is. I go, oh, all right. But I, it was the moment. You know, I, I can't say they were going to hold, you know, Ha Sha Shu, you know, there. And I, it, it just happened, you know? I mean, and that was the trust of the moment. And that's something that JR's work is about. Now, as a filmmaker, I would have that trust. But to create this image for a poster, I didn't have that. <laughs> but 
if JR said, let's do it that way, I go, all right, let's go for it. So that's what I learned, that, that I could translate what I understood in cinematography, in filmmaking, that I could do that in a work of art like that, or a poster, whatever. Good. I think we have time for just a couple more. Um, is that microphone working again? Uh, yes. Perfect. <laughs> Let's do it. Two in the same row, and then we'll wrap it up. Yes, Mr. Lachman, um, your your films are really a work of art, and I feel like it. They're they're just. It's so wonderful that you're such a promo, uh, a defender of uh, shooting on film, and a lot of more. Uh, a lot of recent filmmakers want that option um, instead of just uh, you know shooting on digital. Um, and I wanted to just uh, know how you feel about Kodak bringing back, for instance, the uh, ectochrome and a lot of more uh, film stock that, that they're thinking of bringing back um, since it's just um, really a big difference than, than, than digital. And, um, and, and maybe what are uh, some of your favorite uh, Kodak film stocks? And the, the other question is, would you ever consider writing a book on cinematography? Because I feel like we really would love to, to hear um, your, uh, you know, experience. Uh -huh. you're being in, you're being it's being suggested that you write a book on cinematography, uh -huh, yeah. which I think is a good well, idea. Well, yeah, I've thought about it. And if I have time, I, I'll do something like that. About images, you know. Um, the, 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 I was instrumental in getting Kodak to, to, I mean, I was all over Kodak about doing that. In fact, which I told you before, is the, when the lab closed in New York, I, I got the whole lab. They gave it to me, basically, and I had to pay to get it disassembled and put in storage, which is expensive, but I have the whole lab. So Kodak came to, because I knew eventually it would come back somewhere, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was Technicolor's lab. Do Art and Technicolor created a, the last lab, the New York lab, and then they told me it was going to close the week we were making two prints of Carol. And I said, and they had just overhauled the whole lab, so it's brand new. I said, oh my God, you know, you can't let, the, what's going to happen? And they're going to put it in the trash dump. Uh, so I talked to the general manager. I said, can I have the lab? If I get it out of here, it's yours, you know? <laughs> now, now, thank God, Kodak realized if they're going to sell film, they have to have a place to develop it. So they're going to open up, they're saying they're going to open up like 20 labs in the next few years throughout the world. <laughs> and. Daniel here is holding on the Polaroid, thank God. <laughs> we want to thank you for saving film, well, <laughs> honestly. I'm, I'm one part. <laughs> we'll take one last question, and then we're going to move to the, okay. the even more interactive portion of our evening. Um, first, thank you very much. And second, you just mentioned Chris Doyle, and both of you are some of my biggest inspirations. And I. It came to my mind that I've seen many interviews in which he mentions that that he says that the the, the key for be, being a great cinematographer is not taking it too seriously, and I wanted to know your opinion on that because for me it's very a very interesting statement. What's your big Chris so had made a, uh, apparently made a comment about the, the key to being a successful cinematographer is not taking it too seriously. Is, oh, that, Chris. is that Chris said yeah, that? Yeah, actually. Yeah, I believe, well. That seems like, Chris that sounds is like Chris. Chris, right? Yeah, that's Chris. <laughs> <laughs> what I, do you think I, of that I, idea? Well, I, I don't know. I, take it seriously, not to take it seriously. I, I don't, I mean, I guess he, he's always in the moment, too. I mean, that's the great thing about Chris's cinematography is he's, he's someone that's in the moment. You know, and so I, I think he means something like that, you know, that, uh, you know, not to make it perfect, you know, to make, make, it, uh, make it authentic. That's a better word. To, 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 that the images represent the story through the emotions of what the story is about. And, uh, you know, like in commercials and certain 
Hollywood films, they may, they're always striving for a certain kind of perfection, but do they lose the life of what the image is? And that's, that's really what you have to search for as filmmakers and image makers is, is finding the images that translate the stories that are, the, I say, the metaphor for the story. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do with a director is find those visual metaphors for the emotions of the story. I'm gonna do one last question because I saw one more hand. Lee, let's wait for the, just wait for the mic, one sec. Wait for the mic right behind you. Just a moment, right behind you. Yep, no worries. Do you have a current project now that you've finished the poster? Do, do what I What are you working on now? Well, uh, Todd just called me yesterday, and I'm going to be doing Todd's next film. So, and we're, we're working on a documentary about the Velvet Underground, but that's more of compilation and interviews, so I'm just doing the interviews for it. Sounds like some uh, terrific next projects. Um, Ed, first of all, before we move on, thank yeah. you for thank you for all of your just ongoing uh, championing of this festival. You're a, you're a loyal attendee, and thank you for this wonderful work of art that you've given us. Well, this thanks year. for letting me sneak in for 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> always, always. Thank you, Ed Lockman.